year. Uh, we met Gabe a month or two ago uh, and loved what he was doing and then found out that James was to him, so he invited us to speak, so thank you very much. I'm not going to take too much time and Christian has a much more uh, interesting story to tell, but I just want to uh, let everyone know about the Legal Innovation Zone. Uh, Civic Tech Toronto is about to celebrate their one year birthday and uh, three weeks ago the Legal Innovation Zone just celebrated our one year birthday. Exciting time for all of our We were set up, actually born out of the DMZ. Uh, we looked around the DMZ uh, about two years ago and realized that there were no companies actively working on legal tech or legal solutions. And so we went to the administration and said we got to set up a legal innovation zone. And we did that and really we're focused on three main areas. One is we are probably the world's first legal tech uh, incubator. So we have 19 companies working out of our space, Legal Swipe being one of them. Uh, anything from criminal to family to real estate, a couple companies using automation and or artificial intelligence around contracting and research and all that. Um, and so anyone with an idea is welcome to apply. Uh, and we, we operate very similar to the DMZ, but uh, we also accept earlier stage companies because we are so unique that, that we only focus on legal solutions. Uh, we also do some R&D for, for legal organizations and law firms, and we get very active in the access to justice space, which is project of uh, finding better approaches to families going through the separation process before they have to go to court, uh, which is unfortunately a massive issue uh, and one that uh, has not changed very much. Um, at our birthday, we actually even announced a, a project with the Ministry of the Attorney General. It's called the Access to Justice Challenge. Uh, and so if you want, you can uh, check it out on our website. And what that is, is basically anyone who is actively working on a access to justice solution, a technology-based solution. We have put out a competition. You can apply online. It closes June 24th. And the top six teams will be invited to join the Legal Innovation Zone. And at the end of a four-month stay, you'll uh, pitch to a set of judges, and you have the opportunity to win uh, part of the $50,000 in seed funding. It'll be $25,000, $15,000, $10,000. So um, this is a great group that we have. This actually came out after I, I spoke to Gabe. But um, if anyone here is working on different is, we encourage you to apply or give us a call and ask for information. Uh, but we're very excited that the Ministry of the Attorney General clearly sees that innovation uh, has to be sped up, and this is not that they're trying to do that, but they're definitely taking technology solutions very seriously, as is, I think, much of the government. So um, it's very exciting times for all of us out there. And if you have any questions, just approach me. I'm happy to talk, but I'm not going to take any more time because you guys have Christian Levine, who is a Superstar of the zone. He's uh, he created a really cool app and does a great job. So yeah, Christian. Awesome. So well, from one superstar to another. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, okay. So first, I, I want to get an idea of maybe the type of problems we're dealing with. Earlier on, I heard we have a lot of developers. We have someone in the back. Seems like a legal guy. Anyone on the business side? A few people from the business side, okay, good. So we've got one thing in common. Everyone here needs to get more sleep, right? Um, so I'm gonna talk on a number of subjects today. Uh, the first being what spurred my interest in the law. The second being what spurred my interest in tech. And the last is I'm gonna talk about this fabulous little app I created by the name of Legal Swipe. Uh, so to give you a bit of background on me, uh, I went to York University, I'm sure some of you guys know that school. Uh, I went there for, shout out to York. Oh yeah, shout, shout out to the Brookfield Institute also, I love you guys. But, um, so I, I went to York and I was in my first year of my program, which was Public Policy and Administration. And I was on my way home, it was a cold winter night, I was on my whole way home from work, and I had a police officer actually approach me, walked up to me, and he said, hey, can I see some ID? So, of course, I turned to him, and I'm being a bit of a smart aleck, but I still said, why? Is there a problem? Before I knew it, I was being thrown on the ground. I was searched, literally, I had an officer tackle me. I was thrown, detained in the back of a police car, and questioned for 20 minutes, without reason, and let go, right? Um, now, as much as this is an unfortunate story, it's important to recognize that this happens to people on a regular basis. Unfortunately, they often don't get the platform or the chance to tell their story. So following this, um, I started doing a lot of 
really mentorship work, I said, you know what? It's important that I use my experience as an impetus to try and focus on issues in my community and hopefully how, to see how I can make some type of improvement. So I was involved in a lot of organizations, uh, one of which was the York University Black Students Association, and we were actually doing a, a, a lot of mentorship, not just academic mentorship, but also one-on-one -on -one personal development. So I guess on, on that same line of, of uh, mentorship, uh, eventually I, I found my way into doing uh, government work uh, that focused on policy and on vulnerable communities. And from there, I made my way to law school. So I ended up at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law. And lo and behold, again, what was I doing? I was doing the mentorship because I knew the mentorship piece was really, really important. So I was doing uh, legal rights workshops. This was about, I'd say, my, my second year of law school. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do when I was done. I was somewhat interested in IP law, but I was also interested in criminal law because I thought it was super cool. And I'm doing these workshops, and I, I began to notice, well, a few issues. One of which was the information, well, first, the people who are attending these workshops Generally speaking, they were keynotes, right? It's kind of like, uh, I'm sure you, you guys at Civic uh, Tech Teal find a lot of the times the people are coming out are those who are already converted, right? But you want to get the word out. You want to go beyond that. And that's the problem that I was noticing. A lot of these kids that were coming out, they were keynotes. They may have not been affected uh, by police interactions or police, the issues of police brutality. The second issue I realized was that I was trying to speak to these kids, I'm, I'm trying to present to them, I'm, I'm trying to instill ideas in them, but it's the law. And unfortunately, the law is very cumbersome. And even as adults, if I was to ask you, how many here know what to say if a police officer was to walk up to you right now and ask you for your ID? How many know exactly what to say? Not, not one hand goes up. And could you imagine, oh, okay, one hand goes up. And could you imagine, we're the educated ones, we're the ones who had the chance to go off to we're the ones who had the chance not just to attend high school, but to attend full secondary school. So we're a very privileged subset. But I was realizing with these kids, a lot of this information, it wasn't quite sticking. Um, and the third thing was for me, and, and this is in, in any subject, I always say, there has to be a better way. So I, it, it, it was just a belief that no matter how much we were doing, and trust me, we were doing work, uh, I don't know if any of you are aware, but there's organizations such as the Canadian Civil Liberties Association that actually give out cards to kids and say, hey, here's cards you can actually take out of your pocket during a police interaction and read if you believe such a thing. But for me, I said, look, there has to be a better way. And so yeah, I did these workshops, I wrapped up the year, and then I, I kind of envisioned, well, what if this could be in an app, right? What if there was a way of providing this information to people um, in, in a way that was not only accessible, but it was quick to get through, and it was interesting, right? It, it, made, it made the work, or made the work of going through the law, it made learning the law actually fun. So I said, you know what? Why not put it in an app? So fortunately, I don't have any screenshots in front of me, but because I don't have screenshots, that means you have to go download the app on your phone. It's legal, so I won't worry. Um, so, I put together this app, and there were a few key features, uh, one of which is it gave people the ability to quickly reference their rights on a case-by-case -case basis. So for instance, they could choose their situation. Hey, I'm at home. Hey, I'm riding on a bike. I'm walking, right? And based on what an officer tells them, they can simply choose yes or no, as well as they're given the questions which they have to ask. So for instance, generally speaking, when an officer asks you for an ID, the questions you want to ask is, hey, am I being arrested or am I being detained? And in most scenarios, if you're not being arrested, you're not being detained, guess what? You should be free to go. So that was the first feature. The second key feature that I added was the ability to upload video as well as audio. I thought it was really important that you'd be able to capture these situations because, again, I have the platform here, so when I tell you, hey, I'm beat up by police, you guys are like, he's a lawyer, he's not lying. Or some of you might say, he's a lawyer, he probably is lying. But regardless, 
I know, I understand that my social position allows me to tell you my experience and, and you can take it as a reality. So I said, you know, it's really important that you start to capture these situations. And the last feature which I added was the ability to send messages through the application because why not be able to contact, whether it be a lawyer, whether it be a parent, whether it be a friend, someone in the community can assist you, an advocate, why not be able to contact them straight out of the phone? So, let's see how much time I have. Oh, really? I flew through it. Oh, I got 709. I did fly through it. Terrible. Uh, so, there's a few takeaways I, I, I really want to give you guys. I, and yeah, they did run a lot shorter than I know. But, um, so after I created this app, right, I, and some of you guys might have heard of it last year, but I ended up doing a, a small launch, actually just down the street. So I invited a, a lot of my closest friends, as well as some of those from the legal tech community. I said, come on up, we're gonna have a launch. I had Omar Ha Red Eye, does anyone know Omar Red Eye? Great dude, he's actually, he knows everyone. So he's actually on the, the legal and the tech side. I had Desmond Cole, who I'm sure most of you in the room know, who's been a great social and community advocate and speaking to issues surrounding carding, um, as well as a few other friends speak, um, who again, just really understood that uh, police, well really not just racial profiling, but, um, but uh, police misconduct was an issue in the city, and they ended up speaking there, right? So could, if you guys can imagine, I have this launch, and I had, uh, had a sheet for media, right? For media to sign up, right? So as the night's going on, I'm checking the media sheet. Like every, we'll say 20 minutes, I'll run over to the media sheet, I'll say, who signed up? Nobody signed up. Who signed up? Nobody signed up. I get maybe about three hours into the war. So like, we're wrapping up now, more or less. And I see one name there. Of course, the one name is like a good friend of mine, right? I guess he felt bad, so he signed his name up. So I said, you know what? It's kind of embarrassing, but I put together this launch, I brought together some great people, and no one's gonna hear about this app I created. So I was a bit heartbroken. And then uh, and then my friend Tiffany Gooch, who those who are in government might know her, uh, she comes over to me and she goes, get on Twitter, I have some really bad news. And I have lawyers who, not a lot of lawyers, one lawyer, kind of an asshole. And this guy is just trashing the idea of the app on Twitter, if you can imagine. So the only news coming out is bad news. And you know, I was super, super heartbroken. Um, and then two days later, hey, I got a, a call. And it's actually from Tim Harvey 1010. Desmond does a radio show on there. He says, you know what? Sounds like they're interested in maybe bringing you to a, for a show. For, and then next thing I know, I'm getting a call from Toronto Star, and then CBC, and then all these other great national news outlets. And I start getting feedback from the community. People are calling me, people are going online. They're like, Chris, this is great. A lot of media members are even saying, hey look, if I had the resources or the know-how, I would have loved to make something like this myself, right? Um, and I, I, I'd say, you know, as, as much as I had those losses, it was kind of important because it helped me appreciate when I had my wins. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the application, uh, just, this past December, we had a great venture capitalist come on, uh, Dreammaker Ventures. They're doing some really good work here at Ryerson. Uh, and then most recently, last month, um, we had uh, the Ontario government, and they gave us another six-figure investment. So we're doing pretty well, considering this started out as recognizing that we had a genuine civic problem, and asking, hey, how are we gonna deal with it, right? So the reason I tell you that story is not to impress you or to leave you with a heartbreaker, but to impress upon you the importance of understanding that a lot of great things, especially in civil tech, or civic tech rather, especially in civic tech. I believe so. Especially in civic tech, you know, you're gonna have some failures along the way. You're, it's very rare that anything starts up and it's an immediate win. But it's important that you are driven, or really your, your key impetus should be your end, should kind of be your end game, right? To say, hey, well look, 
you know, I'm not getting the kind of validation I wanted. Maybe I'm not getting the kind of investment I wanted. But to be able to say, hey, look, this is the difference I want to make. And even though you may only make that difference to that one person or that group of people or that one dude online who responds to you on Twitter, that's a win. That's a definite win. So thank you so much for giving me the platform and the chance to speak today. Take the time out to listen to me. That uh, includes my presentation. in legal education, right? And I want that to go beyond just police interactions. I want that to go into, what do you do if you're terminated from a job? At the point at which you're terminated from a job, what benefits do you have? What do you apply for, right? Um, or even when you're a landlord, they want to kick you out. Well, what is it you have available to you, right? So I want to go beyond the basic legal interaction. But to really answer that question, uh, we're hoping people do the education ahead of time. And second to that, if we're in a situation whereby every single time a police officer is having a conversation with somebody, that there's an expectancy that a phone's going to be brought up, or an expectancy there's going to be some type of surveillance which is done, that's where we actually want to be, right? Because no question about us, as everyday citizens, there, there's only an increase in surveillance, right? There's only one more camera every single day that we walk up these doors. But shouldn't the police have that same expectancy? Or else how else do we increase accountability? Um, so it, it wasn't just a project focusing on, hey, it's cool if you know in the moment we can catch these cops or it gets us something smart back. And uh, you know, on that on that same note, right now we're actually doing legal rights workshops. Just uh, last month we did a workshop out in Regent Park. Well, what's going to be formed in Regent Park? We had 35, 40 kids come out, and the information it really resonated with them. Um, not just because it was done through an application or because we tried to make the presentation itself exciting, but because these kids said, hey, I have a way to empower myself now, right? I know what my remedies are. I, I, I know when an officer is doing something that's wrong, and I know where I could go. And I, So it's, it's more than just the ability to say, hey, here's this cool app or this cool piece of tech, but really, how do we change um, how, do we, how do we get rid of this power and balance? Right? That's, that's more the question I was seeking to answer. But that's a great and very fair question. Yes? Any other questions? Um, I mean, I think I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the story that you shared with us. And, and I think that, um, that uh, to me, Legal Swipe represents like a completely different approach to legal education. And, and that the legal the sort of public legal education part that I've seen, I think is like is can be really solid, but um, but that it remains sort of inaccessible or um, that it's not compelling in the way, right? It's that it's the use of technology and just the the, the, the idea of using technology as much as like that. Um, to to me, it was the thing that really sort of got my attention. And so, yeah, you know, I wonder, um, is there is there other work going on in that space, or what's next for legal swipe in this area? Of, you know, like how how can how can public legal education like totally be brought up a notch or a ten um, through the use of technology or other kinds of innovations? Right. Uh, well, I think one of the first things is language. We really need to translate over the application. Um, I noticed that there was a huge amount of usership by French users. I got a lot of emails actually saying, hey, when's this app going to be available in French? Another really cool thing I found was uh, this past December, I found out that um, there were groups out in Thunder Bay, right? First Nations people that were using the app to teach each other on their rights, right? And I said, wow, this is like a real win for us. 
So for us, it's expanding, like as geographically where the app is used, uh, but also expanding what rights are available. Here. Because I, 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 it it's, it's, it's almost hurts me as a lawyer to walk anywhere and to ask the question, hey, who here really knows their rights when it comes to police? And it's like, nobody. And it's like, if you're fired tomorrow, who knows your rights? Nobody. So you have one of two, two choices, basically, right? Either you're gonna fall into that situation, right, of being approached by an officer, and you have to go call a criminal lawyer, or go call a lawyer, and you know, go pay that initial retainer fee. Or hopefully, maybe you know a lawyer yourself, right? Maybe you're friends with a lawyer, maybe you saw me at the presentation today, and you call me up and you say, hey Chris, I ran into an issue, could you help me out here, right? But again, to even fall into that second group, like, there's a, there's a great deal of privilege that's attached to you, right? I think, I'd say, maybe not the vast majority, but there's a lot of people who've never met a lawyer over their lifetime, except when they fell into a legal issue, right? So it's kind of like these people are being double screwed because every time they need even simple questions answered, they're paying a premium price. Whereas the rest of us who know those lawyers, well, guess what? We might get that information for free. So again, for me, it's the expanding uh, the geographic region of the app. Uh, so going stateside um, and, and make sure we're comprehensive stateside. And secondly, expanding languages. Thirdly, expanding what information is there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see that you know we're getting the usership uh, within the first. I'd say I want to say the first two three weeks we had about twenty thousand users. Um, which is great considering it's not like my background was in tech or that we had money to pour into marketing or anything to that extent. And, uh, and now that we're getting the community buy-in or the community buy-in beyond the immediate kind of vulnerable communities, we're getting like the legal community buy-in and, um, and the social justice community buy-in. It's, it's, it's great to see that, um, yeah, we're still getting that kind of validation. So that's where we hope to work. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Christian, basically, they're doing that. I'm at three. Uh, so, we wanted to hear from our call, how we know that we can support you in contact with the Vision on the Street Park Department and other similar matters. This summer, we have this group of people who are working on the Street Park Department. So, what kind of response do you think that we talked about the Vision Park Department? So, um, and I guess this is a, a little less on, on the tech side, this is more on the workshop side, but we've, we've been teaching you uh, not just, and this is something I want to implement into the app to be able to show people what their remedies are. So not just what the law is, or when you're wrong, but what your remedy is. Uh, the, I'd say the general public does not know that there have been civil suits that have resulted from carding. So people have been carded, or maybe their carding resulted in them being beat up. And they've actually taken the police to court and have gotten money. But again, that's a very small subset of people. So it's important that we're able to educate, uh, not just on rights, but to say, hey look, when your rights are violated, these are the avenues you have. This is where you can go. I, I feel like I almost missed your question. Yeah, it's just but, regarding the, the, the youth grant. Right? Yeah, how, youth, how, rest, how, yeah, how are they like to the have? Like, well, yeah, it, it, it resonates with you because the thing is, like, I'm an adult. I barely have time to sit down and read. I'm sure if I ask any of you how many books have you read in the last month, a lot of you will get embarrassed regardless of what the number is, right? Um, so nobody has time to sit down and read through a full menu. So for them, they just like the fact that it's accessible and they could walk with it. Uh, um, and, it's, and it's just exciting because it just sounds cool. Like, oh, you have an app on your phone that tells you what to say when you see police? Give me that right away. Like it just sounds super cool to them. Um, so yeah, it's, we've had really good feedback. Uh, I have one more question. Sure. I, I just wondered if you had any stories about the app performing in the field. No. So I'm going to skip your. So I'm going to skip your sure. question. What was the other question? Have you been experiencing any pushback from law enforcement, uh, legal establishment, and the like? Great question. Uh, so actually, Toronto Police, the Toronto Police Service came out and they said they love the idea of the app. They're in support of anything that, that helps provide legal rights education. So it's been really good. And so to quickly answer your question, unfortunately we don't have any specific stories of someone using the app in the middle of the crisis, which 
maybe good thing, maybe a bad thing, but we'll, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day that that happens. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for giving me uh, Will you be around for the rest of the evening? I'll be around for about 10 minutes because my girlfriend's angry. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, right. I, I mean, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.